you have a commercial herd and you're thinking about adding a south pole, how do you get started? Um, can you take your commercial herd and in five years from now have some registered stock? Yes, you can. You can have some purebreds uh, from your commercial herd. So, so Dakota, looking for introduce yourself to your farm over there and, and talk about the, the, the breed up. Thank you. Um, again, it's more of a better judgment. I'm going to be speaking today. And, uh, <laughs> I am not like Dave. I don't have a photographic yeah, memory. I'm not like I'm not like Becky to where I can just remember what I'm talking about. So y'all see me looking at some notes in a few minutes. And that's that's how I'm gonna work. Um, there you go. That's right up there. My name is Dakota Blanks. I'm from uh, locally here in Appomattox. We're about 30 minutes away. My family and I run Windy Acres Farm. Um, we have somewhere around leased and owned land. We run about 500 acres. Um, it's a we run it as a commercial beef operation, even though we have uh, quite a few registered animals. Um, and a little history of that: we started out. Um, someone told me to start slow. I, I come from a tobacco background, so didn't have a lot of experience with cattle. Um, got into it by buying ten uh, semangus heifers. Uh, I was able to lease the family farm back. I uh, got 10 heifers and a friend of mine told me, said, that's great, just start slow. So in about, I don't know, 60 days, I bought another, we had somewhere close to 200. Um, so that was me starting slow. I just dove all in. I quickly uh, realized we weren't doing some things right. I, I didn't have a background of my grandpa telling me this is exactly what we need to do and how we need to do it. So I always had an open mind about uh, raising cattle and, and, and changing and transitioning. Um, I wanted to learn as much as I could. My wife has always called me the traveling farmer. So when I wanted to see a cow or learn somebody's operation, we'd hop on a plane and go. Um, I started working for a large seed stock uh, registered Angus ranch that we ran. About a thousand head of registered cattle and about 500 commercial cows as well. Um, learning through them, we worked a lot of cattle and got to see a lot of cattle. We fed a lot of cattle. Uh, we were running about 30 to 40 tons of, of ground feed a week just to keep the, these cattle in condition, just to keep them up and looking good, to keep our bulls. We would sell about 90 bulls a year uh, to keep the bulls in condition. They had to be poured with silage and corn and, and everything else that you can imagine just to um, – just to, just to maintain their condition. And I bought one of the bulls and I took it back to my farm and I helped raise this bull and in months he was down to nothing. He had just completely melted away, um, which is what a lot of my other cattle were doing too. Um, and I'm a numbers guy, so I realized this, this can't work um, long term. So we, we ended up looking at some some alternative ways to grow feed because I, I knew I couldn't afford the uh, fertilizer bill every year that I was getting. Um, the guys that were selling me stuff were making a lot more money than we were. We were going broke pretty quick. Um, had farms everywhere and just stretched really thin. Um, so we, I, I looked into the mob grazing years ago and things like that and went to a few little classes um, started really packing those cattle down and they just started falling to pieces. Uh, they couldn't get rebred. One year we had 45% open cows um, after we did it. So we sent 45% of our cows to market um, after they came open. They didn't, they didn't get a second chance. We, we kind of stuck to that culling practice. At one of these advanced grazing schools, I ended up uh, hearing Becky speak, um, give a little talk about grazing and she just happened to mention south poles i had no clue what they were so i ended up calling her dad because uh, becky wouldn't answer the phone uh, so i ended up calling her dad a few times met her dad and uh they showed me showed me the herd and um gave us gave me an idea and when I, the day i went to see them i tell everybody was the day i decided i had to switch because i left my herd and it was probably about nine in the morning and all of my cattle were under the trees. Uh, they were standing in shade, they were hot and they were you know, long haired and just dying. Um, and I get over to Glenn and Becky's and then this is closer to lunchtime now, it's 90 degrees and all of their cattle are out grazing. And it just made me mad. I mean, it, it really did. It, it bothered me because I said, you know, I see what their cattle are doing. Their cattle are gaining weight and they're making money. Um, whereas mine were not. And so 
I think a few months later, I ended up buying a few cows from them, and I still wasn't fully sold on them. Uh, bought a few cows from them, brought them back, really liked them. They were slick. They were red. And every time I went out there in the afternoon, those red cows were out there grazing, and the black ones were under trees. And to me, if they're grazing, they're making me money. Um, and that, so that, that was a huge, huge kicker for why we started changing. Um, I still use Simmental bulls because we were doing part of the breed up uh, program with, with Simmental and Sim Angus. Um, still wanted to raise bulls and sell bulls. That's kind of kind of always been something I've been attracted to. Um, and then I saw in, let's see, I think I saw Dave post something online. I joined the South Pole Forum, and like I said, this was years ago, and he posted something about uh, a weaning weights. And so what all I had known was big weaning weights pay big money. Um, I have soon, you know, shortly thereafter found out that that's false. That's a lie. Um, but he posted something about a ratio of weaning weights to what this cow was. It was a 900 or so pound cow and she raised a 550 pound calf. So her, her weaning ratio was just huge through the roof. Whereas I was running 1600 pound cows who were giving me 600 pound calves and eating me out of house and home. Um, so I went down there, looked through it, and got out the truck, and after about 10 minutes, I decided this was it. And uh, so I got a bull from uh, from Dave that day. We settled on one, I think, and he brought it up to us. And um, started, that, that's really how, how our South Pole journey started. Um, one thing it's, that was hard for me was I only knew two people in the state of Virginia that had South Poles. One was Becky and her dad, and the other one was Gil Yearwood standing back there. Um, so to see this many people around here locally that are, you know, interested in it or have South Poles, it's, it's really exciting to see the breed growing the way it is. Um, but Marv asked me a little bit to talk about some traits and the breed up part of it, um, because we are going through the breed up program as well. Um, we bought a really... A good amount of registered purebreds, full bloods. I interchange those. Um, they're both similar. It's really hard to distinguish which one's which. Um, but the traits that that I think everybody's familiar with is they're slick hided. Um, you know, their temperament is amazing. Most any of their cows, my kids can walk right up to. Uh, nobody worries about getting run over, getting getting aggressive, anything like that. Now they're all cows and we give cows respect. We don't we don't mess with them, you know, intentionally. Um, but the docility was a huge factor for me because I don't know if any of y'all have had some what we call wild crazy Angus, but when you tag an Angus at birth, you better be ready to get down. Uh, because a lot of the times we would we would get just plum run slam over. Um, into fact where a family member bought me one of those calf catchers because I was getting run over so much uh, to try to help, you know, work on the, uh, the hospital bills, I guess. Um, but anyway, so, so we're looking for slick hided, just efficient cattle. I, I'm a big numbers guy, so I want everything to be efficient. If it's not efficient, it's not working for me. Um, we need them to be super fertile. I think, you know, Teddy and Dave, they really focused on fertility a lot. If they didn't get bred in those, that first 30 days, they were they were cold pretty hard it seems like um and so we've tried to follow those principles um is as far as fertility slick hided smaller frame cows so now we're running we're running about 40 percent more cattle on the same amount of land we were with big big framed uh angus simmental cows and and there i still have some some angus and some simmental but they've they've worked with what we've given them. You know, we've put them, put them through a job and they have to do their job. And if they don't, they get, they get sent down the road, quite frankly, um, no matter who they are for, for the most part. And uh, it's, it, it's really satisfying to see that we weaned, j just take a number, we weaned 150 calves versus we were weaning 90 calves. Now our weights are a lot smaller uh, not a not a huge amount, but we're we're weaning upper four calves, four nineties, low fives, whereas we were weaning some six weights and upper sixes. We've got a lot more cattle to sell now um, per acre, and so that that's what's really made a big point to me is is how many pounds of calf can I sell off of my farm, and it's not how many calves can I sell, but how many pounds of calves can I sell. Um, 
we've never had an issue with with moving our calves. Um, there's a huge, huge demand it seems like for for grass based steers especially. Um, we're we're constantly getting calls, and not just from Virginia, but from anywhere. I was telling Dave yesterday or the day before, we've got somebody who wants a bull in New Hampshire all the way down to Florida. I mean, we get calls all the time for, for loads of steers, for heifers, for bulls, all those things. So the demand is is really, really uh, there, which kind of leads me into the uh, breed up process which when the demand is there, the, the prices are high. And I don't think they're too high. I think for good cattle, you have to pay for good cattle. Um, but it's hard to find if somebody in here wants a group of 10 or 12 heifers, uh, registered heifers, it's really hard to find it. Um, it just is. We, we find them, but we, we drive to Missouri. We drive to Alabama. We drive all over the country if we, if we find the right, the right group. Um, and I know Marv has done the same, you know, Marv and I went to Texas, you know, trying to get him some in February. We, it's just that that's kind of the way it is right now. But the benefits of the breed up program is we can take a purebred bull and we can put them on any of our cows, no matter what they are. Um, and that first generation is 50 percent, uh, second generation, 75 percent and so on. Um, to be a purebred registered heifer, she's got to be a sorry, seven eighths, um, seven eighths purebred, purebred heifer. So that's gonna take you about seven years to get there. From, from where you start on day one, if we were to turn the bulls in November 1st of this year, in seven years, your herd can be a purebred South Pole herd. Um, takes one more generation for bulls to do that, to become purebred bulls. So that's, that's about a nine year trek. Um, if you put the bulls in Thanksgiving to get September 1st calves. Uh, but but in that, that time frame, what the value you've created to your herd is pretty pretty immense. Um, people are asking me all the time, where, where can we get a group of 20? It's really hard to find. But we know guys that have some really good commercial Red Angus and Herefords and th things like that, that you can start your breeding up program and the value just increases every, every generation. Um, I was telling somebody the other day, it's so much better for him to go and buy a group of, of adapted cattle that's in his area and start putting South Pole bulls on them uh, financially than it is for him to try to track down a few that may not be adapted to his, to his area. Um, so, but like I said, the, the first group of calves that we got out of a South Pole bull were were just fantastic. I mean, you could walk through and see that the difference, because we were we still had a South Pole bull and we had some Simmental bulls at the same time, and you could pick those South Pole bull calves out. Uh, that first cross, they were slick and they just finished well, um, and all the grass finishers we, we sent them to just loved that first cross. So just the benefit of using a South Pole bull opens you up um, to selling to different grass finishers and things like that. Um, I would say I know a lot of people see uh, South Pole heifers and what they're bringing and they aspire to do that. And that's that's fantastic. But I would say that that's a different game. Um, and that's that's not how these cattle were were bred to be. They were bred for the commercial purposes. They were bred for efficiency. And, and I think that's a big push that we need is to stay on track with our cattle is to cull things that need to be culled. Uh, just because it was born a bull doesn't mean he needs to stay a bull um, and, and keep the integrity of the breed. Uh, just because it has South Pole in front of its name doesn't mean it's great. And just because it's not registered doesn't mean it's not great. Um, so those are some, some definite things to consider uh, when you start getting into the breed. How many people in here have South Poles of some sort? Bulls, cows, something. How many people are completely new to the concept of South Poles? That's, that's, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good uh, show of hands. So that, that just goes to tell you that, that this herd, this breed is growing uh, dramatically. And it, it's exciting to see our numbers go up. Um, but the more people we get involved with it, the more bulls we start using, the more availability we'll have on some of these cattle. And, and quite frankly, when it when it comes down to raising cattle, a lot of people. How many people just sell at a market? That all, all you do is just just take calves straight to a market, and 
And that's totally okay. And that's what we get from a lot of people. How do they sell at the market? Um, for me, I never wanted to sell at a market because the market told me how much my calves were worth every time. And I wanted to decide how much my calves were worth. Um, they said, well, red calves get docked so hard. Well, when it comes down to it, we're raising efficient cattle. I need something that does good on grass, that fills up and that grows. Even if you take a hit at the market, when you look at your bottom line, you're still you're still making more off of it, an efficient cow herd. Um, but going back into uh, a little bit more of the traits is something that we've noticed is the the frame size on bulls is feeding them too on when you're running when you're running 1800 2200 2400 pound bulls that was not uncommon for a lot of us um to see it really tore up our cattle um which brought into the longevity factor i don't know that on that ranch that, that we had a thousand head registered angus i don't know that we had a cow over six years old and longevity plays a huge part into making money with this breed, to making money in any cattle operation. A cow's got to stick around, whether you're commercial or run and register cattle, she's got to be able to stick around to get your money back out of her. Um, I was lucky enough to yesterday, Dave brought me a bull that his mom was 20, 20 Dave? Yeah. So her 18th calf, right? 18th, 19th, something like that. 19th calf made a herd sire. So whether that's a registered cow or whether she's commercial, she had 19 calves. I mean, that's a huge, huge moneymaker when you're talking that the average lifespan of a commercial cow in America is a little over five years uh, before their feet go bad, things like that. So what Teddy and Dave have done for structure of animals and for longevity, fertility, slick hided, it's just it's just through the roof and, and I wouldn't go back. You're going to... Go ahead, Dave. We got one that's 22. What's that? We have one cow that's 22. But the reason they last a long time is they don't cow that. They're in, she's in about every category. She got struck by lightning when she was 28. She was 28. She got struck by lightning when she was the second half. How did she survive the lightning strike? She didn't survive. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> At 28, it's hard she to do that. Yeah. And so there again, Dave said the, the oldest cow that a lot of these South Poles go back to lived to be 28 years old, got struck by lightning. She was probably going to be 50, I imagine, if she didn't get struck by lightning, something like that. Uh, but longevity was, was a, such a big thing. Yes, sir? The cows, the, the cows that you're talking about, like how big a bull, how big a South Pole bull can you put on, or can you put on, like your herd if you're looking for so he's, his question was what what size bull so i've got one south pole bull that we looked at yesterday dave could probably agree he's probably um 1300 pounds something like that and he's breeding a group of commercial charlets that we still have um he's probably 1300 pounds and those are probably 1700 pound cows and uh he absolutely had no problem whatsoever as a yearling breeding those right, right. but or go ahead. That's a 1300 pound bull, but like just say some of the bulls I've, I've read or heard or seen advertised might be 17, 1800 pound South Pole bull. Yep. And you're putting them on a commercial cow. Yep. Maybe 1400 pounds. Are you, are you breeding down sideways or it's like, how do you, how do you have to get to a thousand pound cow? That's probably a little bit difficult because it depends on the cows that you're putting them on as well. So that you may step down. So that first cross may end up not shrinking frame too much. Uh, because you're going to get an extra punch of heterosis out of it. But that shrinking that frame size will come. So, like I said, on those Charlets, we put a two or three frame bull. Those are much smaller heifers coming out of those. Um, but I would say, you know, most most South Pole bulls are probably running in the 1,500 pound, 1,600 pound range, somewhere around there. And Dave, Gill, y'all can, can chime in on that if you think otherwise. Um, well, that could be a very, uh, cow, I mean, there's been a lot of research there on that cow. She can raise a bull that's 85% bigger than she is. Besides the size of that cow, she weighs an 1,850 pound bull. They're red. But she's that uh, over 64 four cow. Most she's ever weighed was 1085. And she's weighed, raised two or three bulls by 1800. Right. Right. And so, and where I was getting at was that 
a lot of what we had was breakdowns of those huge bulls. The the 2,000, 2,200, 2,400 pound bulls were just hurting the cows. I mean, when they were breeding them, you'd, you'd shortly thereafter having cows limping or this or that, especially in the winter and the fescue didn't didn't help with that at all either. Um, but I think that about wraps it up for the breed up, unless anybody has any questions on it. Okay. So we're, we're trying to do the same thing, but we, this year has been the first year we've had some trouble with open, open cows that didn't get rid of. And of course, we talked to several different people, and um, they're emphasizing, obviously, that it's a cow. You know, they're red Angus, black Angus, Charlotte, you know, mm -hmm. mixed like you have. So would you still use that still ruthless culling program? Where That's – so the question was, would you still – Cull hard for a lot of these open cows. That is a really hard thing to do on year one. Um, when I decided I'm going to, from cows that were just, you know, grazed with bulls year round, had calves year round, and said, I'm going to go to a 60 day calving ring. That was hard. I mean, we took a huge loss. But for me, it was worth it because then I'm checking cows for calves for 60 days instead of 365 days and looking for problems 365 days. Um, but if they're open, would you maybe give them a second try? Or just... If you know that you had enough bulls to cover them in the right amount of time, they probably, it, there again, did drought affect them? Did they have good quality forage? Did they have everything they need and they still didn't get bread? Then they probably need to go down the road. Or, or you know, there's some fantastic burger to, to sell as well. But um, I know it's a hard hard choice to make we do have two cabin seasons right now we were all fall uh we bought so many cows from all over the country that we had two years ago we had calves 12 months out of the year not by choice and so we ended up splitting and doing two seasons that way some didn't have to wait a full 11 months to get rebred if they missed the bull by a week you know um but i personally i don't think they deserve a second chance Unless we know it's something something that went wrong. Um, unless we find out that the bull wasn't as fertile as we thought he was. Um, that they were really stressed out due to something um, that, that could have caused it. Uh, had a discussion. I pulled a calf the other day uh, that was backwards. And that's a discussion I had in my head. Do I cull her? It, what, you know, what was it? Um, she was a really good cow for us. I've, I've really liked her, but she's probably going to go down the road. Um, Dave doesn't think it was genetic reasoning for it. The calf can get turned. It's kind of a physical thing, but is she worth the, the value of what you could have there? Um, if you take her, her opportunity cost, where I've been burned, I think, is before when we gave cows second chances, they probably came open again 60 or 70 percent of the time. So then I would feed them an extra, my cow cost would run 450 to $500 a year of feed to get that cow back to where she could get bred again and then miss. So not only did I lose $500 on her from feeding her, I lost a year of opportunity on having a cow that could have gotten bred. Um, it's kind of kind of the way I look at it. So it's the opportunity cost. If she's, if she's eating that much, you know, that's three bales of hay by the end of winter for some people for one one cow depending on how much land you have so it's a hard choice to make but um i think i think they were cold pretty hard if they weren't fertile and i mean and if they're not fertile you got nothing i mean if that should be the number one in any in any herd is is fertility because if they can't get bred you don't have anything but a bunch of steers out there so um yes ma'am does anybody do ai so yeah, so we've got. Have to keep the bull all year? Sure, sure. Uh, there's several people out there doing AI. We AI'd um, our first group. Uh, I didn't have a bull yet, so I AI'd about 50 of them to South Pole bulls. Um, I know Bentry has 30 or 40 bulls on on hand that they have uh, seen and collected on, and it's probably. Somebody in every state. I think Marv's got, you know, some on a few of his bulls and, and things like that. But if you've got a handful of cows, it may be a very good opportunity. The other thing is, um, if you can be okay with moving your calving 
season just a little bit, you can lease a bull from a lot of people. We've most of us in here probably have some extra bulls that you can lease for work thirty days, sixty days, or or something like that if if uh, needed. But um, it's you know kind of you. It depends on if it's efficient for you to run a bull on five cows or not. 